Hello, and welcome to today's presentation on seismic braced frames in Reza Connection. I'm Matt Brown, and today I'm going to be explaining to you how you can get the design of braced frames for seismic areas using Reza Connection. Now, today's design is going to be done per IBC 2015. Of course, IBC 2015 references ASCE 710. That's where we get things like our R values and which seismic systems are allowed for which conditions. And then ASCE 710 references AISC 341, <coughs> also known as the Seismic Design Manual. And that's where we're going to get all sorts of provisions that are specific to how we design the connections, how we design the braces, the columns, so on and so forth. Now for today's example, what we're going to be doing is the design of a three-story building with braced frames. Now in this three-story building, the height of it is going to be three stories, each of which is 11 and a half feet. So we end up with a total height just shy of 35 feet. And you'll see why that's important as we move on throughout a few design revisions on this. Now the risk category is two, and so that's just an ordinary uh, commercial building usage. Our SDS value that we're gonna use is 0.35G. Now you may be taking a look at this saying, well, 0.35G is fairly low. I mean, there's a lot of different places where I can hit a seismic design value such as this. So this isn't just like a California situation or a St. Louis situation where we have very high seismic forces. You're going to see in today's example where even if you're doing a design, say, in the Midwest or the South, you may still be dealing with seismic forces that are large enough uh, that you have to consider these extra seismic provisions even though you may not be used to doing it. And you'll see how the program can be automated to do that. So even if you're not familiar with the seismic design manual, you'll see why you may need to end up becoming familiar with that. So with an SDS of 0.35G and an SD1 of 0.14G, you'll see that we fall into seismic design category C. Now design categories A through C aren't what you would typically think of as high seismic and so normally you would think alright well I can live uh, outside of that just doing the ordinary methods that I know from the steel manual and of course with seismic design category C if we take a look at ASCE 7 we can see there's no seismic detailing required in this case and so in this case we can use an R value of 3 and we don't actually have to go into the seismic design manual at all this is just going to be a traditional brace frame design so with this laid out here, let's actually jump into the design in the structure. So what I've done here in Risa Floor is I've created a model of a three-story building. Now this is an L-shaped building in this case, and we have three braced frames for each direction. So you can see the red lines indicating the lateral systems in the building. I have three north-south brace frames and three east-west brace frames. So these have already been laid out because of course today we want to focus more on the seismic design of these not just on how to model. But of course the idea behind Risa Floor is that I can create a model of these braced frame or create the whole model of the building here including the brace frames and come in and get an analysis for gravity in Risa floor and then we're going to step into Risa 3D under Risa floor to get the lateral design so for most of the day we're going to be living in Risa 3D and Risa connection but in this case it was easiest just to start off with the Risa floor model for those of you who are doing things like industrial structures where maybe Risa floor wouldn't be your primary usage you can still get by with just Risa 3D in connection and everything I show you today is also going to be applicable regardless of whether or not you're using Risa floor in this case. Now what Risa floor is doing right now as I solve is it's optimizing all the beam sizes for us and that's an iterative process so it takes a little bit of time because what we're doing is a finite element analysis in order to figure out uh, for each beam what the exact forces are and then be able to optimize the size based off of that. And right now we can see it's finishing up the design. So now with that design complete, <clears throat> I can see here all of my beams have been sized. And so at this point for gravity, there's not too much more to look at. 
What we want to do is move into the lateral design because that's the most important thing for us today. So I'm going to step into Risa 3D. And in Risa 3D here, I can see we can set the seismic code. So we have this set up for ASCE 710. There's our R value of 3. So I've set all this up ahead of time with the numbers that we previously discussed. And we can see in here that our base shear, for example, is about 270 kips, seismic design category C. So this is a relatively lightly loaded seismic structure in this case. I'll hit OK, and we'll come out into Risa 3D. And here we can see that the brace frames are shown. Now, of course, the whole rest of the structure is still present. In fact, I can come in here and graphically view it. It's just been filtered out of my way in this case. So all these members are being considered here in this case. And of course, the diaphragms as well, including their openings, are being considered as part of the load distribution. These are rigid diaphragms in this case. And let's just take a look at these frames. What I'm going to do is come into the Connection Rules Spreadsheet. Now, of course, whenever I want to assign a connection to a member, I have to set up a connection rule. And I have two rules set up right now, a diagonal brace rule and a chevron brace rule. And these are both set up here using the diagonal and chevron braces. And let's take a look at how I assign those in the model. So we'll come up here and show connection rule. And you'll note that I only assign connection rules to a couple of braces in this case. The reason being that in this presentation, I'm going to be illustrating to you some specific uh, aspects to the design of these braces. And so we don't want to have to spend time designing 50 different gusset plates. The program can absolutely do that, and it's quite easy. But if you don't want to have to sit and watch a progress bar all afternoon, then we'll just focus in on these ones right here. So we can see this is one chevron brace example that we're using. Here's one diagonal brace, which is at the bottom of that chevron. And then we have this other diagonal brace right over here. Now let's also take a look at the member types. For these diagonal braces, you'll see that I'm using wide flanges for the beam, the column, and the brace as well. Whereas with the chevron braces, I've got a pipe column that, or a pipe that's being used here as a brace, and then wide flange uh, columns and beams in this case. And note that the, for this direction, the beams are framing into the weak axis of those columns. That won't be a problem. One other important thing to note is if I go to the Members Spreadsheet and I go to the Advanced tab, you'll see that for seismic design rules we have none. So what that means is no special seismic provisions are being considered. And this is, of course, the default whenever we do anything in the program. Uh, when I create a new model, everything's set to none. We have to go out of our way to assign special seismic detailing to these frames. So let's take a look at the load combinations. And you'll see here that I generated load combinations for seismic, including all of the accidental eccentricity combinations, the overturning combinations, so on and so forth. But once again, in order to speed this up, I've picked out four controlling load combinations that will control everything for our design today. So let's just solve those. I'm going run, gonna to run a batch and envelope solution in Risa 3D here. And then we can come out to the model view. And let's go ahead and turn on the Unity checks, the code checks. And I can see the envelope results for the code checks here. So we can see these members are about 68, 69% stressed. Uh, most of the members aren't all that stressed. So in this case, we'll say that we had picked out these uh, braces just sort of, it's over conservative, over designed. And we'll see how well that works out. So now I'm going to use the director menu up here to go into Risa Connection. And when we launch Risa Connection, what we'll find is I actually went ahead and did the design of these braces for R equals 3 ahead of time. So if I come up here and hit Solve Project, what's going to happen is we're going to get a solution for all these braces. And I didn't bother showing you me putting these brace connections together in the first place because we don't want to focus on the R equals 3 design. For those of you who want to know more about that, you can actually go back and watch my previous brace webinar, which was predating when we had the seismic checks. And you can see exactly how to do these designs without the extra seismic checks. But in this case, let's just take a look. So here for that chevron brace, we can see we're using a clip angle to the bottom of that beam, and that's welded on there and bolted on here. And then we have these uh, tubes 
uh, welded and slotted around the gusset plate in this case. Now that's going to require some field welding, but uh, that can be rather typical for this sort of design. Next we'll come over to the diagonal brace and you'll see here that we have the wide flange coming into the gusset and we are using these claw angles to grab the gusset plate and then a plate right there on the front of the uh, gusset in order to connect that wide flange brace into the gusset which then goes into the beam in the column. So here we can see that design arranged there and you can see this gusset is welded onto both the beam and the column. And then I'm going to come into the diagonal brace connection. Now this is the bottom of our chevrons. So this is that same pipe in this case. And you'll see that this connection is laid out so that the whole beam and gusset assembly can be bolted right into the column. And then the brace can be bolted right into this gusset plate. And so we can see what we have here is sort of a T assembly that's been built up and then bolted into the gusset plate. Now when I solve these, you'll note that it says pass over here in Reza Connection. And that means that everything is passing in this case for all of my checks. So like I mentioned before, I actually went ahead and sized all of these connections in order to be able to handle the forces for an R equals 3 design. But of course we do want to go beyond R equals 3, so let's go back into the model here. <coughs> and what I'm going to do is I am going to save this model. So let's just go ahead and do a save as on this model here. And we are going to call this the Seismic Brace OCBF. Now the reason we're doing that is as shown here in the PowerPoint slide. What we've had happen here is we have a design revision that's occurred. This building that we did will now be housing a 911 emergency call center. Now what that means is that the risk category has jumped from category 2 to category 4. The importance factor has increased to 1.5, so now our forces are now 50% higher, and most importantly, we are now in seismic design category D. So even though we're not located in what would traditionally be considered a high seismic area, because of the use of this structure, we have to design this thing basically as though it were in a high seismic area. And this could happen in any number of different designs whenever you get into these higher risk categories if your uh, building or your structure is somehow considered an essential facility. Now R equals 3 design is actually not allowed for design category D, so if we take a look in ASCE 7, what we're going to find is we are going to be forced into using the OCBF. That's the Ordinary Concentric Braced Frame System. And in the case of the OCBF, we have an R value of 3.25. So our R value is barely higher than what it was without any seismic detailing at all, but we're going to see that the OCBF does carry a lot of baggage with it in addition to us having to get a minor reduction in the amount of forces in the model. So coming back into Risa 3D, what I'm going to do is go up to the model settings here and I'm going to go to the seismic tab and I'm going to change that R value from 3 to 3.25. Now one bonus that we do get by going to OCBF is that our overstrength factor, the omega, then drops down to 2 instead of 3. So that's going to help us out a little bit. But still when I hit OK on that, this warns me that the seismic load is going to be updated and sure enough if I go into the seismic load sheet here and we recalculate I'm still in design category C until I change the risk category to 4. Now that jumps me up to D. So you'll note that my base shear has increased due to that higher importance factor even though my R value increased which would typically lower that value. Next I'm going to come into the load combination spreadsheet and because we're now into the special seismic detailing checks per the AISC 341, this requires me to solve with the overstrength combinations, so I have to have those omega level loads. I'm going to go into the load combination generator, and under seismic, I'm going to tell it to generate me the overstrength load combinations. And when I hit that, you'll see that it generates an extra eight combinations for me. I'll uncheck these bottom four as I know that they're not going to control for any of our brace design, so this will allow us to actually speed up our solution in this case. The next thing I have to do is assign a seismic design rule to these frames. So if I come on here to the seismic design rules spreadsheet, you'll see that the program comes with a number of 
seismic design rules that are already set up ahead of time. So I have this OCBF rule that applies to columns, beams, and braces, and that will give us checks in RISA 3D on the members to make sure that those are meeting all those special code requirements. So in this case, let's go ahead and assign that seismic rule to all these members. I can do that under the modify design right here. And we're going to say for seismic rules, this is OCBF. And let me just visually verify that, yes, all these frames are now assigned to the OCBF. Now, another thing that we need to do is change our connection rule. Our connection rule is set up to do an ordinary vertical brace connection, or not ordinary, it's set up to do a non-seismically detailed one. We want it to do an ordinary connection. That's another point of confusion, by the way. Having an ordinary brace frame is different from an R equals 3 brace frame. Even though they call it ordinary, it's far from ordinary. It has a number of extra different checks that need to be done. So we're going to set this up as a diagonal brace seismic and a chevron brace seismic instead of the typical ones. And so now we should be able to solve again in RISA 3D. And when we run through this solution, we'll see how these frames now work out with the higher seismic forces applied to them and with the extra checks associated with OCBF. And so if I come in here and take a look at the code checks for bending, what we'll see is that in this case, we actually end up getting a failure uh, reported in here. So this column that we have uh, set up as a W12 by 40 just isn't working out. So let's go ahead and upsize that column. But instead of do just doing that one, we'll go ahead and do them all so that we can have some universal detailing here. So I'm going to change these columns. And I'm going to modify the size of the column in this case to be, say, a W12 by 50 instead of a W12 by 40. And so if I apply that to all these columns here, and then we solve again, we can see how those work out. Now that's occurring just because we had the extra seismic rule on there, which requires the columns to be designed for omega level loads. And we can see now that with that higher W12 by 50, that column works just fine. So now let's head over into Risa Connection and see how this has impacted the design of our connections. Already we've seen that we've had a column has to get just a little bit larger in this case. So now that I'm in Risa Connection, we see we have the same connections laid out here. And let's just go ahead and focus on these connections one by one. So we're going to start by taking a look at that Chevron connection that we had. I'm going to hit Solve on this connection, and we're going to see that it reports itself as failing now. <coughs> So if I come into the reports and read the connection, here we can see exactly what's wrong with this one. We're on a summary report for the connection, which shows us the worst cases for the four connections, or the three connections that are really part of this. And that is the gusset to beam connection. That's the interface where the gusset connects to the beam. And then where the gusset connects to each of the two braces. And then finally, there's additional seismic calculations that are present now that we're part of an OCBF system, as you can see indicated here. So what we see is that the gusset to beam connection is actually working out just fine. That passes. And if I step over here for a moment, you can see all the green passes. We didn't have any changes to this whole connection right here as a result of switching over to an OCBF. So that's good. However, we are going to find some other issues. So let's go to the seismic tab and take a look at these results. And what we see in here is that we're actually passing for all these different seismic checks, except for this one right here, seismic brace slenderness. And if I open that up, what we see <coughs> is a failure listed for both braces. And what it says here is the condition KL over R is greater than this equation. And then it references in the code exactly where that comes in. Well, if you take a look in the AISC 341, what it says is that chevron braces can't be any more slender than this certain prescribed amount for an OCBF. And if I look down here, we can see the actual slenderness is 96.6, but the code maximum slenderness is 96.3. So we were really close right here, but it just didn't quite work out in this case. So the brace that we're currently using, if I click on it, it's a 7-inch brace, we're going to have to make this a larger brace so that our KL over R increases, or decreases, rather. So going back into Risa 3D, I'm going to come into my section sets, and let's change this from a HSS 7 by 0.375 to a 7500 by 0.375. 
Now you might also notice that I'm using A1085 braces in this case. These braces are of a newer material available for HSS that has better seismic performance and so I'm going, getting some advantages out of here by using this A1085 brace as opposed to the A500. But I do need to make sure when I do this design that I indicate on the construction documents that these need to be grade A1085. Now coming back into connection with that larger brace size <coughs> We can see visually that brace got a little bit bigger. And when I solve in here now for the Chevron connection, we can see that we are now still failing. But now under seismic calculations, we're passing. So the failure is no longer occurring as a result of those braces uh, being seismic. It's just the actual design for the forces in this case. And so here we can see the gusset plate compression is failing. So that's the Whitmore compression block in this gusset plate is causing a buckling or a tearing in this case of the gusset. And this is just due to the higher loads that we have. So if I click on the gusset plate, we can see it's a half inch gusset. I'm going to bump this up to a 5 eighths inch gusset and solve again. And now we see that we're passing. And so I just punched in 0.625 when I clicked on that dimension. That made the gusset larger. And so now we can see for all the limit states in this case, we are doing just fine. So the Chevron connection is now working. And note that all we had to change on this connection in order to get us to work for an ordinary concentric brace frame versus the standard R equals 3 frame was just to bump up the brace diameter a little bit and increase the gusset thickness. So that's really not too bad. But we'll see on the next one where we run into some issues. So if I go over to the diagonal brace and I solve this one, we're going to see this one takes just a little bit longer to solve and one of the reasons why is this is having to calculate all the force interaction between the column, the beam, and the brace for multiple load combinations. One of the nice things in Reza Connection is that we bring loads over by load combination as opposed to bringing over the envelope forces. So we're not doing this design for the maximum uh, brace force occurring at the same time as the maximum shear occurring at the same time as the maximum column shear so on and so forth instead you'll see from this drop down we actually bring over the forces for each load combination for each member so it's a lot more forces to keep track of which slows down the solution a little bit but it gives us the ultimate inaccuracy and we also don't end up with an overly conservative design where the maximum forces are all occurring at the same time now coming into the reports here, one thing that I'm going to notice right away is that the beam is failing under the beam column connection. So we can see here our unity check is 9.99. That's a very bad failure in this case. And scrolling in here a little bit, one issue that I see here is that we have a beam shear yield and a beam shear rupture problem. And then coming down further, a problem with column flange, bending, web yielding, and crippling. And I can expand out any of these checks to see what the problem is here. But clearly, the beam and the column are not up to the task of handling the forces that are occurring within this connection. And there's nothing that we can do in the actual connection itself to make these pass for all of these checks. Instead, what we actually have to do is go back and upsize these members in this case. So I'm now going to go back into Risa 3D. And let's go ahead and adjust that for the diagonal brace members in this case. I'm going to select all of these beams that we have here. And I am going to upsize those to a size that I actually know ahead of time will already work for us in this case. I'm going to change the beams to be a W18 by 106. And I'm going to change the column sizes here to be a W12 by 152. Now these may sound like crazy numbers to those of you who aren't used to doing seismic design, but at these levels of forces that we're dealing with here, uh, these are actually uh, somewhat commonly used member sizes for the high seismic areas. And so coming back in here, we finish our design. Of course, we see that for Unity, we're doing quite well in this case because, of course, the connections are what's controlling our design. And so coming back into Reza Connection here, <coughs> I can solve this connection again and we'll see how it turns out. So now we are still failing in this case, but if I go over to the beam column, at least I can see that the beam 
and the column are passing. So we can now address everything else solely based off of the connection elements themselves. Now let's take a look at some of our failures in this case. I see that we have a bolt tension at column failing. And scrolling down in here we can get all of our information and we can see that it's really an interaction between bolt tension and bolt shear that's failing. Now coming back out into the main screen we can see that with only three bolts this just isn't adequate. So I'm going to click on this and bump this up to five bolts in this case. And then also if I go back into here we saw that we had some prying action that was occurring. And so one of the things we can do to address that is thicken up this clip angle. So I'm going to go ahead and bump this up to a half inch thick clip angle in this case. And so now I'm going to solve again within connection here. And hopefully at this point with this much larger connection to the column, we've addressed our issue that we have with the beam column connection. And we can see here that yes, now we're at 99% stressed for bolt tension. But hey, 99% stress is good enough for us in this case. So now coming back into the 2D view, we can see what our connection looks like. And what I'm seeing here is that this brace is pulled awfully close in here. In fact, we can see that this clip angle is getting some overlap with the gusset to beam connection. So maybe I want to pull that back just a little bit by reducing the clip on this gusset plate. So I'm going to click here and enter in a new number. Now that pulls us back a bit. And now if I solve again in this case, we can see how this connection is working out now that we've addressed all the issues up here at the beam to column interface. And so coming back in here to the summary, we can see that they're working out for everything for uh, seismic checks and for all the connections except for the gusset to brace connection where we have web plate interaction problems. So coming in here to bottom gusset to brace, we can scroll down and here seems to be our real issue. It's the web plate. It's failing for compression buckling. It's failing for flexure. It's failing for interaction between flexure and buckling. Well, of course it's going to in that case. So coming back in here, if I take a look at the web plate, note that the web plate's only on one side here. Well, this wide flange brace is carrying a huge amount of force in it in this case. If we want to come back into the reports for a second to see the design forces that are coming in here, uh, we should be able to see that the uh, web for compression is carrying uh, quite a bit in this case, uh, 56 kips of force required out of it. And so if I click on that plate, we can switch this over to be a double-sided plate. And so now with the plate on both sides, if I solve again, that should hopefully take care of the issue. But we can see we still aren't quite there yet. I'm still seeing a failure on it. So I'm going to click on the plate and also make it a little bit thicker. Right now it's a half inch. I'm going to bump it up to a 5 8 inch. And you'll note that all I have to do is just click on the plate and then enter in the new value over here in the properties. And so now at this point, everything passes. Now let's stop for just a moment here to talk about uh, the seismic checks because we sort of glossed over it under the chevron brace. But of course we want to understand a little bit more about what's going on with these checks. Essentially what's happening here is the program is calculating an expected strength for these members. Now this is all required per AISC 341. And so what happens is we ran those omega or overstrength level loads and those are what we consider in Reza Connection to be the user input loads. So these are loads from analysis and then the code tells us that the uh, analysis forces don't ever need to exceed what is called the expected strength. In other words, how much strength do we actually expect the brace to have during an earthquake? Because of course if the brace fails or buckles, then we don't need to worry about extra forces above and beyond that getting in there. Now once we're able to calculate that, we're able to come up with load combinations. And so we can see here under seismic loading combinations, we have two different load combinations uh, that are used for seismic design, one where the brace is in compression, one's where the brace is in tension, and we refer to these as load case 1 and load case 02. So for 01 and 02, I can click right here, and here we actually get all the load distribution that was done in this case, and this is all done during all done uh, using the uniform force method. So this is how we're able to derive what the force is at every single connection interface that occurs within here. 
and then you'll note that we have the uh, work point limitations. In order to be a special concentric brace frame as opposed to eccentric, we must have concentric work points. And we'll hit some of these other issues later on, so I'm going to just move on to the next connection in this case now that we have this one working. So next I'm going to go to the diagonal brace that occurs down at the bottom of the chevron braces. <coughs> and I'm going to solve for this one. And what we'll find out in the report here in the summary is that this one fails for beam shear rupture. So similar to what we ran into in the last connection, we see that this beam is just totally inadequate for the force. And it's not a connection issue, but this beam just won't be able to handle it. This is a W8 by 40. And so we're going to bump this up to be a larger beam so that we can get that to pass. So I'm going to go back into Risa 3D once again. Is the nice thing is that Risa 3D can kick over updated information on members and loads into Risa Connection at any time. And I'm going to change those beams to be a W10 by 60 instead of a W8 by 40. That ought to beef them up a bit and ought to be able to get us to pass for those failing beam checks that we're seeing as part of the connection. So now that that's solved, I can use the director to go into Risa Connection. And coming in here, now I can see I have a larger beam. And so this should work out better. Of course, with this little clip angle on here, though, I'm probably still failing. And coming in here, sure enough, we see a failure for clip angle shear yield in this case when I come over into the beam to column connection. And so in order to address that, I'm going to have to increase the thickness of this angle. You'll notice these themes occurring a lot throughout our design that basically a lot of the default numbers that we use for an R equals 3 brace frame just aren't cutting it for these larger ones. So I'm going to solve again on here and we'll find out now that we are passing at this point for the beam to column connection. The top gusset to beam connection is good and the top gusset to column connection is also good. But now under here, the top gusset to brace connection is failing. So let's take a closer look at that. And scrolling down here, I see failures all over the place relating to the stem. So the stem is buckling. The stem is failing in tension and compression. The stem is failing in flexure. All over the place, we're having these stem problems. And we're also getting a brace local yielding. Well, coming back in here to the 3D view, what we see is that this stem is failing quite a bit, and the local yielding that's occurring on that brace is actually going to be occurring right here, right where the brace hits the T of that stem. The forces aren't able to spread out enough. One thing we can do to allow the forces to spread out enough and to strengthen this stem up considerably on the T is to go ahead and change the plates that we're making this built-up T out of to be thicker. So right now these are half inch. I'm going to take them all the way up to a 7 8 inch thick plate in this case just by clicking on each dimension and entering in a larger value. And then it also told us that the weld is failing. We'll take a look at that weld we have right there. That's a PJP weld, and it's only 5 16 but on a 7 8 that's a ridiculously small weld in this case. So let's go up to a half-inch weld so we're at least covering half the thickness of that with our PJP. And then I'll solve again on this connection. And we'll see that that passes. And then I can hit solve on the project here. And we will see that everything else should pass in this case. And so now with all of our connections passing, I can send those results back into Risa 3D. And in Risa 3D, if I want to, I can actually visually verify this. So if I'm living mostly in 3D here, I can see these green values. Those indicate passing as opposed to a red value, which would indicate a failure in Risa 3D. And so you saw that we had to bump up a few different things to meet those ordinary concentric brace frame requirements. Uh, but there's still more that has to be done once we end up going up to these special concentric brace frames, which is really the main focus of today's presentation. <clears throat> So let's go back into our PowerPoint here for a second and take a look at the next design revision that's coming in here. Namely, that we'll say that the architect has increased the building height from 34.5 to 36 feet. So the building's only gotten one and a half feet taller. But what we've hit now is that in ASCE 7, they say that for seismic design category D, that ordinary concentric brace frames can't be used for buildings taller than 35 feet. 
and before we were below that limit, so we were just fine with our OCBF, but now we're going to have to use the special concentric brace frame. And the special concentric brace frame carries a whole lot more extra detailing requirements than the ordinary one does. You'll see that in your seismic design manual where the OCBF provisions are only about two pages and the SCBF are probably about ten pages in there. So there's a lot more things to consider, but thankfully the program's handling most of that for us. Now that doesn't mean that you don't need to know what these provisions are, but you can know at least that the program can help guide you through them. Now one of the benefits we get from considering all these extra provisions for ductility is that we can use an R value of 6 as opposed to having that R value of 3 or 3.25. So what this effectively means is that our design forces are going to be cut roughly in half. So with the design forces cut in half, that should help us out quite a bit, right? Well, of course, one of the downsides is that we're going to run into issues relating to what's called expected strength, which I'll be getting into more in just a moment. So coming back into Teresa here, let me just step back into Teresa floor for a moment. And what I'm going to do is I am going to do a save as on this model once again. And I am going to save this as a SCBF model. And let me close out of the Reza connection that we were in before. And so with the SCBF, let's go back into the floor spreadsheet and make that change that we saw, that the building is now 36 feet. So of course we're outside of the realm of what we could use. And then I'm going to use the director uh, to go back into Risa 3D after, of course, I solve again in Risa floor. Because we changed the floor to floor height in Risa floor, this affects the columns. And because Risa floor can do column design in addition to beam design, it now has to resolve in order to be able to get us that design. And of course, one of the other considerations too is that with the eccentricity of connections on these columns, Risa Floor is having to do a skip load analysis for each column to make sure that it captures the worst case for unbalanced shear forces coming in from each direction so that we can get the correct design for the columns in terms of the combined axial and bending forces. So it's running through right here and resizing some of these members for us. And then we're going to be able to go back into Risa 3D and address things from there. Now one thing that I did forget to do in this case is I did forget to set up our member design rule. And so the member design rule is where we can get the, uh, the, the limitation on what the member sizes are going to be. And so in this case, if I just close out of this real quick and pop this back open, Sorry, it looks like it flipped over to the other screen on me. So this will take just a second here to load up. My member design rules that I had previously set up with this model, what they were doing was they were limiting me uh, in terms of what my member depth restrictions were. And so if I come in here, I can see that I was telling the program that for the beams that are part of the diagonal brace frame system, that those were supposed to be between 11 and 13 inches deep. But of course, we actually had to make those 18 inches deep in order to solve earlier. And so coming back in here, if I hit solve again, that's going to uh, eliminate that restriction. Otherwise, what I realized as I was solving here was that even though we had bumped those beam sizes up to 18 inches, because this rule was still assigned to them that was limiting them to basically be 12 inches deep, Risa Floor was going to re-optimize those to be 12 inch deep members that could still meet the strength requirements of the larger 18 inch members. And so that was going to give us some very hefty 12 inch members. And of course, this is something that uh, you need to pay attention to when you're setting up these design rules is if you start manually overriding things you may need to go back and update the design rules accordingly. So now at this point we are running through our solution here and we're just about wrapped up with that analysis and then we're going to be able to go back into Risa 3D and update our connection uh, or our seismic parameters to be able to handle the extra SCBF requirements that are considered in this case. And so with that finishing up the solution right now and then going in and doing that column skip loading analysis that I mentioned, we'll be able to get back in and specify the other seismic parameters. <coughs> Oh, 
All right, excellent. And so with that solution done, I will transfer into Risa 3D. We can see here that our R value is still set to 3.25, but we can actually uh, change that now to be a 6 for the R. And we're still at risk category 4, so everything else is all the same as far as this goes. If I go to the seismic tab, uh, we can see everything is all set up the way that it needs to be. Now note that I do have the seismic design rule of the SCBF, so I'm going to need to change all these frames so that they are part of that SCBF rule instead. So I'll come up here, we'll say SCBF, and apply it to all of these ones. And so now these are all part of an SCBF as opposed to an OCBF. All right, so now I have my special concentric brace frame rule assigned to all these members. The next thing that I'm going to do is come in here and go ahead and run the load combinations again. So I'm going to hit the solve batch plus envelope and we'll see how this works out. Now that we've cut our seismic base shear basically in half, that should help us out considerably with this member design. And indeed, if I come in here and take a look at the members, we can see from the envelope member unity check results, everything is way under stressed. So everything's only about 33% stressed. That seems like it'll help us out quite a bit, but we'll actually see where there's a flaw in that. And that's when we go into Risa Connection. So now that I'm loading up Risa Connection and we're using the special concentric brace frames, let's go ahead and jump straight into the diagonal brace in this case to take a look at this one. So right here, this design is laid out uh, how it was before uh, for the OCBF. And if I go ahead and resolve this one, what we're going to see is that the beam connection is going to fail horribly. And the reason behind that, we see right here beam to column connection, is because at this point now, take a look at what my demand force is in here. For example, the uh, the beam weld strength or the column flange bending. We have just shy of 800 kips of demand force coming in for tension on that beam. Where does that come from? Well, if I come over here to reports and I come over to seismic, what you're going to see is that in the case of the design for the special concentric brace frames, whereas before with ordinary concentric brace frames we only had two load cases, now for this seismic load distribution we have four load cases, S1 through S4. And let's talk about those for just a moment. So I'll pop back over into this PowerPoint slide to illustrate something to you, and that is the way that a brace frame works uh, within the respect of special concentric brace frames. So the first thing we have is what's called the expected strength of the brace. And simply put, that is the maximum tensile strength that is actually expected out of it. And so there's values uh, RY and RT that are reported in the seismic design manual for different materials. And those tell us how strong we think the brace really will be as opposed to the sort of conservative FY values that we use for normal design. And so when we multiply the ordinary design strength uh, by these RY and RT values, we get the expected strength, which is a very high number. Now, if we take a look at this load case right here, let's just say that for tension, we're going to say that this brace has a capacity of 200 kips, and for compression, it has a capacity of 100 kips, because, of course, it'll buckle. And we can see here for the free body diagram for the forces, this is how it moves. So we have an equal amount of force coming in and out. If these are symmetrical braces, we have really no net vertical force occurring on that beam. Now what they require you to consider as part of a special concentric brace frame is they require you to consider what happens when that compression, compression brace buckles. In other words, we're assuming that during an earthquake that that compression brace is going to buckle and once that happens it's basically become useless to us and this tension brace is taking a whole lot more force. And so in this case if we have that 200 kips of tension because we've maxed out our tension brace, well for our compression brace, they're saying that it's going to buckle, and after it buckles, it'll only be carrying 30% of its compression capacity, which is still a little bit, but not much. And if we just consider the free body diagram here, if I have a huge amount of tension pulling on here and a little bit of compression coming on here, we end up with this gigantic unbalanced force. And that unbalanced force needs to be transferred into the beam. And so coming back into Risa Connection, 
we can take a look at what we have here for our seismic load combinations. And so we have the four different cases, S1 through S4. And let's just go back into the beam column for a moment here uh, by taking a look at the seismic load distribution calc for governing. So that we're not only going to give you all the different seismic load combinations that have to be considered, but what the governing ones were. And if I come down here and take a look at the beam to column connection for axial tension, there's 750 kips of axial tension force getting pulled between the beam and the column, and that's governed by load case S3. And if we come up here, we can see uh, that load case S3 in this case is going to give us all the different forces that went into this one. Now if I want more information about it, one thing I can do is pull up the help file on this topic and you'll see here that under seismic vertical brace connections we actually lay out for you tables that explain in more detail what all of these are in this case. And so in this case for the diagonal brace, case S3 is considering that bottom brace to be in tension. And so what we're saying in this case due to this unbalanced force that's occurring uh, is that if this bottom brace is in tension and pulling really hard right on here, then of course that's going to pull the beam. And why is this unbet why is this brace pulling so hard in this case? Well, if I come back into my reports here and I take a look at what my uh, values are, my actual uh, force that's coming through, uh, if we take a look at that user input uh, tensile force in this case, is 60 kips. However, the design tensile force is 973 kips on that brace. So we see how much more that has to be designed for. The reason being that in special concentric brace frames, we have to design this to take the maximum force that that brace could even handle. And of course, a W10 by 60 brace can take a whole lot of tension. And so trying to design this whole interface for the maximum tension that a W10 by 60 can handle is just not going to happen. There's no way that we can get those forces to transfer through here. And so what we're going to find out here is that the easiest way to address this situation is to decrease the tensile design load across this interface here. And so in order to do that, what we're going to need to do is decrease the expected tensile capacity of the brace. In other words, in order to make this connection stronger, we actually have to make some of these members weaker. So I'm going to go into this brace frame in this case. And let's go back into Risa 3D and let's change the member sizes. I mean, we can see from right here from our Unity checks, these braces are way oversized. Well, I'm going to come back into the section sets and instead of using this W10 by 60, let's j drop this thing way down. So we'll come in here now to the shape selection and go to the tubes and I'm going to find the A1085 tubes. And we will go ahead and set this up to be a 5.5 by 5.5 by 3 8 tube. A1085, and while I'm at it, I'm going to change the chevron braces to be 5 inch diameter instead of 7.5 inch diameter. So we've really shrunk these down quite a bit. And if I solve and reach a 3D now, we're going to see that we're much closer to unity in the case of all these braces. And by dropping the brace capacity, we're also dropping the demand force on that gusset plate. And we can see right here we're about 90% stressed. So that's pretty ideal. So by going with the smaller braces now, I can come back into Reza Connection in this case, and let's take a look at how this worked out. So now, when I take a look at this tube that's coming in here, this is the same connection we had before, but just altered for the different brace size. I can uh, go ahead and solve this connection and come up here under Seismic, and now we can see for the governing load calculation, instead of having to design for about 800 kips of tension, we only have to design for about 370. Still a huge amount of force, but this is actually manageable. We can make this work in this case. So I'm going to come into the 3D view here, and I'm going to click on the clip angle, and we're going to go in here and set this to be a thicker clip angle in this case. And let's go ahead and bump that out to 5 bolts and increase the bolt size. So now when I go back and solve this, I'm going to go ahead and make these A490 as well, so we get the super high strength bolts in this connection. We can actually make this work. And so if I come into the beam column connection, uh, we're seeing that we are no longer failing for bolt shear or bolt tension.
So we actually managed to get that to work just by shrinking that uh, beam size down. But you'll also note that the beam and column are now failing. We have a column flange bending failure. We have a beam shear rupture failure. And so in this case, I have to go back into Risa 3D, and although I had to downsize all of those braces, I'm going to actually have to upsize the beams that are working with those braces. So let's come back in here and upsize those beams in this case. We will take those up to be a W18 by 143. And I will hit apply to all of those. And then let's go to the columns and I'm going to change the column size as well so that we eliminate that flange bending failure and I'm gonna go ahead and set those columns to be W12 by 190 so we're getting up to some pretty beefy members in this case but this is gonna be necessary in order to meet these higher demand forces because of course now we have to design this brace frame connection for the maximum force possible not just the maximum force that actually occurred due to analysis so coming back in here now, I can go ahead and solve that diagonal brace connection again. And we see that we're still failing, but there's going to be other issues we have to address. <coughs> coming up here to beam column, I can see we're passing for everything except for the beam weld strength in this case. And we can see that we have a quarter inch fillet weld on there. I'm going to zoom in, and sometimes the nice thing in connection is that in 3D, I can just visually verify things. And I can see that that weld could stand to be a fair bit bigger. So I'm going to bump that up to a 3 8 weld in this case, uh, because we have such a thick clip angle, and solve again. And then now, coming back in here to the beam column connection, we finally have that passing. So if we take a look here, this connection right here is finally what it takes in order to be able to carry all of the tensile force from this brace pulling into here. All right, so now the next thing we want to do is come in here and go back to the summary report, and we can take a look at some of the other issues that we're facing. So if I take a look at the bottom uh, column, bottom gusset to brace in this case, I see that I have a gusset plate tensile rupture and tensile yield. This is based off of the Whitmore section. So what we're getting in this case is that this gusset plate is ripping out right here uh, due to all that tension in the brace because, of course, our tensile design force uh, in this case is 513 kips of axial force coming through the brace. So I think we're going to need to have a thicker gusset just looking at it visually here. So I can click on that gusset plate and bump it up from a 3 8 to a 5 8 gusset. And let's go ahead and adjust this gusset. I'm going to change it so that instead of using the zero moment uh, aspect ratio, we're going to give an unlimited aspect ratio. That doesn't lock down our width to height aspect ratio, but what it does do uh, is now there can be moment on these interfaces where these welds are. And that's going to be fine in this case. Now, we need to make this work out, and so let me go ahead and set the gusset size to be something a little better. So we're going to make it a 42-inch by a 16-inch gusset in this case. And let's go ahead and uh, eliminate the clip on this gusset. But one thing that we'll see is we have this yellow line here. Now this yellow line is only present when we're talking about these special concentric brace frames. And if I go into the reports under seismic, we'll see exactly where that comes from. Basically, what we're having here is a gusset rotation issue, and this relates to ductility. Uh, in order to meet the ductility requirements for a special concentric brace frame, the brace needs to be able to buckle uh, without having the gusset plate be the failure point. And so if I come in here under seismic gusset rotation capacity clearance, I'm getting a failure. And what this is saying is that the uh, distance from the end of the bottom brace to the hinge line, in this case the yellow line, needs to be somewhere between 2T and 4T. So that's between 2 times the thickness of the gusset and 4 times the thickness of the gusset. So that means that I have to actually pull this brace way back so that if this brace buckles out of plane, that the failure on the gusset plate will be a hinge line that can be very ductile right about this yellow line right here. So I'm going to bump this out so that we pull this back to a distance where right here we can see that we're not quite at 2T at this point even. I may need to get it out just a little bit further. All right, so now we are about 2T away from uh, this yield line. So we're now in what would be considered an acceptable range for buckling on the gusset. 
<clears throat> of course, the real problem that we're going to run into in this case is if I come over here to the uh, reports and take a look, yes, we're no longer failing for the seismic gusset rotation, but we are going to be failing pretty badly for the brace weld strength. Look at that, we're 700% overstressed for the brace weld strength. Well, of course we are. We're trying to carry 500 kips of brace force through about three inches of weld on that brace. And guess what? Even if I click on this weld right here and bump it all the way up to be a, a half inch thick fillet weld, we are still going to be failing miserably in this case. And so with it resolving right now, we're going to take a look at how bad we're doing. Now note that it takes a little bit longer to solve in this case because the program is having to consider four different uh, load cases, that being the various expected strengths and post-buckling strengths for each load combination. So that's quite a bit. Now take a look at this. The brace weld strength is failing by a factor of nearly five. In other words, coming into the 2D view, if this is 3 inches long now, what we really need to do is have this be about maybe 16 inches long, 15 inches long. But if I pull the brace any closer in, then we're going to pass this yield line, and then we fail for the seismic check. So we're sort of stuck in a bad situation here where as I try to pull this in, then we fail a seismic check. As I pull this out, we fail the weld check. How do we address that? Well, one thing we can do is to make the gusset plate larger. So if I bump this out to be a 60 inch by 26 inch gusset plate, well, then I can move that brace work point out a bit further. And so now, look at that, we've doubled the length of the weld. Uh, but we're still nowhere near where we need to be. As we said before, this weld is going to have to be about 16 inches long, not 6 inches long. So let's go ahead and bump this plate out even more. I'm going to take it all the way out to be a 10-foot gusset plate. And this is one of the difficult things to get around when you're dealing with this special concentric brace frame design is that here I'm all the way out at a 10-foot gusset plate wide and I'm still not getting enough weld to carry this. So this is definitely an issue and it's one of the reasons why with special concentric brace frames you may see a number of buildings that are built that have gigantic gusset plates. It's because of this. Well, there's really no way around solving this other than making this gusset plate much larger unless we change the way that we consider the yielding on the gusset plate. And so for that, what I'm going to do is come over here under the general settings and you'll see that we have an option under gusset plate clearance. Now, what we have here set is the 2T linear offset. Let's go into the Reza Connection help file for just a moment here so that we can better understand what's happening with that. Well, if I come down here under 2T, what it says is Reza Connection checks to make sure that the hinge line for that plate is about 2T away from the end of the brace. And that this is a limit that's suggested in the uh, commentary of the uh, AS, uh, AISC 341. But one other thing that's shown in some of the design examples is the use of an elliptical hinge line. And so this isn't uh, explicitly shown in the, the code itself, but rather it is referenced in some of the design examples that are in there. And so if I go back into the program, we'll see that I can choose this elliptical hinge line, and suddenly that makes things much better. So let's cut this gusset plate all the way back down to 20 inches tall. This is 20 by 50 inches, a much more reasonable size. And now we can see that yellow line represents the elliptical hinge line. And so this is far less conservative, but it is still realistic and it's used in the AISE design examples, so we can get away with this. So if I come back in here and solve for this connection now, what we'll see is that we can actually get this to pass for us. It is going to take just a little bit longer to solve in this case because, of course, we have this uh, elliptical uh, line that the program has to figure out all the geometry on, which takes just a little bit longer to get to the bottom of. And so once this finishes up solving for all these different cases, we're going to see that by using that elliptical hinge line versus the straight hinge line, we actually do much better for performance. So at this point now, the program has went ahead and finished up that check. And if I take a look at the summary, um, we are getting a seismic weld strength failure. 
and we're getting that at both the beam and the columns. So for the seismic welds, they require them to be very strong, and in this case, we just have these plain fillet welds on both sides. Let's go ahead and change those to be PJP welds. Now, I know some of you may be tempted to go ahead and make these uh, CJP welds, but just keep in mind that in this case, a PJP weld with a throat thickness of 3 8 is more than enough to be able to handle this situation for the strength that we need. And while you may not necessarily care about it, uh, the guy who's having to do the welding on that will probably thank you for not making him do a full pen weld in a situation where he doesn't have to. Now I'm also going to up the gusset plate on here to be 3 quarters of an inch, and it's going to be a grade 50 in this case, and that should make this work out better. So now when I come back in and solve, we see everything passes. So this is really kind of a neat, uh, compact way of handling this design, is to use this elliptical uh, hinge line as opposed to the straight hinge line. All right, let's move on now to the diagonal brace in this case. And so if I solve for this one, what we're going to see is that uh, we're getting some pretty bad failures as well. I'm getting a bolt tension at column failure, a beam shear yield failure, uh, and so with all of these failures that are listed in here, this should all feel rather familiar, of course. The beam is failing due to the seismic uh, demand forces that we're getting out of here. And so we need to address this by upsizing the beam. So I'm going to come back into Risa 3D once again. And I'm going to go ahead and upsize these beams. And for the size on this one, we're going to make these uh, pretty large. We're going to go with a W12 by 106 on this one. So we're, we're getting some heavy duty beams. And I'm going to show you in a little bit how this works out in terms of material takeoff with how much we end up with. So now that I've solved in Risa 3D, Let's just double check that we're not failing anything. Nope, everything is all still looking good, nothing in the red. And then I'll go back into Risa Connection. And we'll take a look at this diagonal brace connection here. And what we see now is we are still failing, but now at least we have a little bit of depth to work with on this beam. Note too that that beam is going to require a cope. That's something you may not have uh, known right offhand when you're trying to work with this, but at least the program's able to point that out to us so we're aware of it. Now I'm going to change the clip angle on this one uh, to be a 4 by 4 by 5 8 So once again, uh, whenever we're using clip angles with these seismic connections, we want to use some really heavy ones. I'm going to take us up to 3 bolts in this case, and I'm going to change these bolts so that they are A490, so we get the highest strength we can, and I'm going to put them up to 7 8 bolts as well. And so now when I go back and solve this again, and we take a look at the beam to column connection, that connection is working. Have you noticed, by the way, that the beam to column connection actually ends up controlling in a lot of these designs? Uh, you would think the gusset plate was more of an issue, but this is what we found in the program, is that this connection actually ends up having to take a whole lot of demand force. Now if I come back in here and go to the seismic checks, we'll see that we're also failing for that seismic weld strength at the beam and the column. Once again, uh, that's nothing that a 3 8 PJP can't solve for us. And so that's going to perform much better than the fillet weld in this case. So I'm going to come in here and set a 3 8 PJP for both the column and for the beam welds in this case. And you can see that right down there. So now I'll solve again. And we'll come back to the summary report for this connection here and we see the seismic gusset rotation capacity also failing. So there's that yellow line. I'm sure you can imagine it's going to be quite difficult for us to pull this whole stem outside of that yellow line and still maintain any sort of a reasonable gusset size. So once again, I'm going to go to the general settings here and change the gusset plate clearance to be elliptical. And now we're able to meet that requirement without having to do anything further with it. So if I come back in here to reports, now under seismic, we have met all the seismic requirements. But under the summary, we see that for the gusset to brace connection, I'm getting some failures. And these are all related to the stem and the T assembly. And so what we can see right here, we're getting bolt bearing on gusset, on stem. Uh, stem interaction is failing by huge amounts. And what this really means is that this stem that I'm using here, there's no way, no matter how much I beef this stem up, 
that we're actually going to be able to get this thing to work out. Uh, this sort of connection is fine for the lower design forces that we had before, but for these high design forces, I just can't transfer the amount of expected strength in this brace through this bolted connection, even if I add a lot more bolts. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to change this one so that it's slotted around the gusset. Now one thing that I forgot to mention earlier is when you do a slot around a gusset, uh, when you're doing a seismic design, you do need to add a little bar of reinforcing on the tube here to make up for the lost cross-sectional area of the tube where this gets slotted. Uh, an upcoming uh, update to Reza Connection is actually going to automatically add that reinforcing in there, but uh, for right now in version 6, uh, you do have to consider that when you're going to be putting this uh, on your drawings and doing the sort of final detailing on it. And so if I come in here now, I can adjust this gusset plate size. So we can shrink that down just a little bit and solve it and come through and see how we're doing. And we are almost there. All I'm going to need to do with this case now is it looks like increase the brace weld strength. And so if I come back out here and click on that brace weld, we see right now that that's a 4 sixteenths. Uh, I can increase that to a 5 sixteenths fillet weld, and that'll be able to handle that. Um, and then the only other issue that I'm running into at this point is I'm also getting a Whitmore section failure on the gusset plate. So maybe we need to go ahead and bump this all the way up to be a 3 quarter inch thick gusset plate uh, to be able to handle those sort of forces. All right, excellent. And so uh, with the failure still continuing, another option that I have in my back pocket when you're starting to get really thick on these plates here is you can actually go in and set that to be a grade 50 plate. Uh, by default, everything in the program is set up as the uh, grade 36. And so still getting a little bit of failure here, but then I'm going to eliminate this clip as well. I'm going to shrink it way down. And if we get rid of that clip, we're getting rid you know, we had a little bit of material savings there, but we do much better now here in terms of having a longer weld because that clip isn't nearly as long. And so I can actually solve the rest of the weld strength problems simply by shrinking that clip down just a little bit until the point where, yes, now we pass in this case. So having this clip move back and forth directly affects our weld length and then of course the tube can't move past this yellow line so even if I tried to make it move past there by punching in a different number the program won't let me so it's hard coded in there to keep us outside of that ellipse alright and then for the final connection we had for this case for the SCBF we go back to this chevron brace that we had and so with the chevron brace the trick that we use uh, to not have to uh, deal with these yield lines in the diagonals was to go with the elliptical yield line, but there is no elliptical yield line uh, for the chevron brace, or at least not anything that we've seen derived anywhere. So unfortunately, we're stuck with this 2T offset for the chevron braces. Uh, and so for that, the only way to get around it is just to go bigger. So let's go ahead with an 80-inch gusset plate. 27 inches high in this case and let's adjust our work point so I'm going to go ahead and push this out to a little over 37 inches away all right and so now with the gusset plate thickness of uh, 5 8 this 1.58 dimension means that we are more than 2t outside of there so we're fine and let's go ahead and change that uh, attachment to the uh, beam. As we mentioned earlier, instead of doing a double fillet weld, a 3 8 PJP usually does the trick here. So if I solve this again, we're going to see that we are failing. And for what? Well, we're failing for the brace weld strength. And as we learned earlier, one good way of dealing with that is just to shrink those clips way down. So I can go ahead and drop that clip all the way down to just be a one inch clip in this case. Um, and so with still failing on the brace weld strength, maybe we can make that go up a little bit. Here I'll click on this brace and we'll go to a 7 16 weld in this case and a 7 16 fillet weld in this case. Now of course these are going to be field welds so people might be a little upset with you but sometimes when we're dealing with uh, having to 
meet all of these crazy requirements from the code, we have to uh, resort to things like this. And in this case, slotting around the brace is one method of getting around that. So coming back in here, the final failure that we're going to get reported for us is a Whitmore uh, compression failure, and that can be solved just by giving us a thicker gusset plate. And so now when I solve, this brace passes, uh, the diagonal brace passes for all three of these ones, and I can export those results back into Risa 3D here, and we can just visually verify it. So there are our passing checks. As you can see how long that took just to do a couple of these braces and imagine for a moment having to do hand calcs on all of this. I mean just look consider all the four different load cases that you have to consider in there. The uh, rotational ductility checks in here, uh, all of these different uh, governing forces. It's really at a point where hand calcs are almost impossible to do for these sort of connections because of the huge amount of numbers that you have to crunch just to meet all the code requirements. But we do explain to you in the program here each code section where this comes from. So it's very handy to be able to pull out your seismic design manual at any point to better understand why you're getting a failure where you are getting a failure. So how did this all work out for us? Well, our initial R equals 3 design, I did a material takeoff in Risa 3D and saw that the uh, self-weight was 60 kips. To go to the OCBF, we more than doubled the weight uh, compared to the R equals 3, so 125 kips. And with the special concentric brace frame, even though we shrunk down those brace sizes in order to reduce the amount of expected strength in there, it still jumped up by another 25 kips. So you can really consider that as you're uh, increasing uh, your seismic system here from R equals 3 to OCBF to SCBF, you are going to be going up in weight, uh, and a lot of that is just about achieving these maximum levels of ductility. But in most design cases, you don't really have an option as to which you're going to end up with.